The reason we don't let them hand feed those guys is because when they eat, you lose a hand. Any of these birds that I tried to pick up are gonna bite and they're gonna fight. The stingrays are the worst. They're, they're like being in a litter of 100 puppies and they're just all over you. I'm John P and we are here at the Tennessee Aquarium in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee. Today's episode of Geek Beat is brought to you by Netflix. We have Tom, who is the curator of fishes for the entire Tennessee Aquarium. That is a big job. It's a huge <laughs> job, and it not one person can do it, we'll put it that way. Yeah, you must have a whole team. Tell me about your team, and what, what, what kind of things do you guys focus on here? Sure, well, my team and I, there's 15 and a half of us. we got one part-timer. Uh, we focus on the fish, uh, the, the freshwater fish, the marine fish, the reefs the uh, aquatic invertebrates, that's what we do. Birds, mammals, uh, reptiles, plants, all that goes to somebody else. We focus on the fish, and of course, fish don't breathe air, they breathe, they get their oxygen from the water, so we're responsible for all the water quality. So we have a, a full water quality lab that not only measures uh, the chemistry, pH, ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, heavy metals, those kinds of things, but also we test for coliforms and things in the exhibits where maybe we have mammals or people putting their hands into water to make sure the health of the water is good and safe. Now just on a technical level, I mean if you have to be responsible for all of the fish, all of the animals, and then you have to also be responsible for all of the water quality, these are different disciplines. How do you learn all that or do you divvy it up among the team so that you have different specialists or how does that work? Yeah, well, for in our department, having to, to handle the different kinds of fish, there's a lot of basic knowledge that works for all of it. System design, flow, fil filtration methods, um, and then the water chemistry is a little different. My entire staff is expected to understand it. I do have a designated lab tech for consistency purposes, but the entire staff is expected to be able to interpret the results, be able to address their systems accordingly. And of course, if, if you're my aquarist, you may have a small system that you do the backwash on it or change the filter or, or run the system how you see fit. On the other hand, you may be in charge of one of the larger systems that is too big for you to run. That's actually computer automated and run through our water, our, our plant down in the basement with the big pumps and filters and controlled by, by our operations team. You know, you just said a whole bunch of stuff that makes me really geek out because like I've got a pool at my house and I'm horrible at managing my pool. It's only 25,000 gallons, but you're talking, we haven't even talked about fish yet. You're talking about filters and pumps and mechanical systems. Can we take a look at it? Absolutely, we've got more of that stuff here than you can shake a stick at. Oh, we definitely want to see it. Okay guys, we're gonna, let's go take a look at this stuff. Oh my God, Tom, these are huge machines. I've never, I have never seen tanks this big. I mean, this even puts like beer breweries to shame. What are these things? Thanks, yeah, well, you know, they're really nothing more than what you have on your swimming pool at home. These are very large sand filters and they're driven by very large pumps. And they work just like your sand filter at home. In fact, we have to backwash these. Now, at home, you probably turn your pump off and turn a multi-port yeah. valve. These are computer controlled. Uh, but th these four filters here behind you actually go for uh, our tank number T6, which is our River Giants exhibit. Oh, wow. Which is, uh, we access it from level four and we're in the basement and we have a mezzanine. So what's that, like six floors? between us. So the, these are all, the water is filtering through here and being pumped up like at least three floors or maybe four floors into a giant tank. How big is that tank roughly, gallons wise? About 88,000 gallons. Wow. Right, and we run about uh, 1,200 gallons a minute uh, total flow rate. So we've got good turnover on the tank. And this, this is not only where we clean the water, but this filter system is also our biological cleansing of the water. Kind of like when you flush your toilet and it goes to a water treatment plant, yeah. we have to do the same thing. We have a, a biological component to our filtration that actually processes the fish waste and cleans the water. What about like, I mean, how do you kill all the bacteria and stuff? I, I, 
I have a saltwater pool, so it generates chlorine right. when I add bags of salt. Do you guys, what do you do for that kind of stuff? Well, that's a great question. Um, I mentioned earlier that we actually, uh, we do bioassay testing on our water uh, and look for coliforms, you know, bad bacteria. In a system like this, what you're trying to do is encourage good bacteria to grow, and hopefully they're out competing the bad bacteria. To help manage that condition, we use ozone on many of our systems. It's where 20% of our water goes through an ozone contactor. We, we uh, interact the water with the ozone gas for a certain amount of time, then we off-gas the ozone, and of course we have to destruct the off-gas, and then that water has been cleansed. It's almost like running it through bleach and then taking the bleach back out. You oxidize everything, and then that clean water goes back into the main system. That is amazing, and these are just these are just filters, but if we peek back over through there, I mean, there are just, I see these giant motors everywhere. There's just pipes everywhere. What other kind of systems do you have running through this facility? Well, in this room, this what you see is pretty much all a replicate of what we just talked about. Okay. Now, what else? Well, like different ones for the different various tanks. That's right, different exhibits. And you probably don't want to put everything on one system because if you get a sick fish, and what he has is contagious like a parasite, then everybody's got oh, it. Yeah. So having different systems is good. Um, and there are other uh, processes we use throughout the facility, like the ozone I talked about. It's not located in this room, yeah. but it's tied in with these systems. Uh, some of the filtrations actually built into the building are bio towers and contact chambers and degas units. Sometimes they're just part of the concrete building or sometimes they're in other areas. Elevation plays a role. So they may be in another tall room like a chase or something. That is crazy. Okay, uh, humans can't run this stuff. How do you manage all of these things? Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, you know, maybe one system a person could stay on top of if they had a team, but the number of systems that we have is just not possible. Uh, we have an operator's staff who operates the building like you would operate a shopping mall or uh, a sky, skyscraper or something, but they also operate all these large systems. I'd be more than happy to take you up and let you see the control center. Oh, we want to see the control center. Let's do that. Let's do it. I see something that all the geeks are going to totally love, just a, a wall of monitors with all kinds of... How do you even read all this stuff? Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm not really qualified <laughs> to read all of it, although uh, we had our operator put on some of the screens that show some of our life support, and I can't explain those. But to answer your question, we have a uh, team of operators that are here 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They Even don't on Christmas? Christmas. Thanksgiving, Easter. Uh, Do they feed the fish some turkey on Thanksgiving? I don't know. No comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell us about some of these screens. This one, it, this looks like the actual aquarium. What's going on here? Yeah, well, if you take a look at that, you can see the different places. In fact, near the top on the left there, it says Gulf of Mexico. Oh, well, oh, yeah, right there. Right right there. there. And, and where we are is uh, a level below where it says stroller. Oh, right here. Yeah. We're down, we're down yeah. in the basement. That's right. And then the level below where we are that you can't see there uh, is where our pumps are. Oh. So you can see the distance. It's, it's got to run that water for that Gulf of Mexico tank that we were talking about. Um, additionally, when we did our opening interview uh, up in the uh, Cove Forest, yeah. I don't know if you could hear or if you saw the waterfall back in the back there, uh, but that's actually the T34 mountain stream system right there. And so what you're seeing on that screen is they're able to monitor flow rates. Uh, they can tell what the uh, flow rate through each filter vessel is, the flow rate for each pump, the total system flow, the flow rate through the contact chamber, degas tower, um, and then they can also monitor the levels of all the different pools. You notice on the graphic there, there's several different places where the water changes level. I got to tell you, I don't know what any of it means, but I do see things like 130 gallons of system flow, That's and right. the chart in general is more sophisticated than the computer you see in a Prius. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. And, and they have complete control over all of this. Um, this is just a graphical representation of what's going on, but the reality is uh, they can click into each one of those parameters they can set a high point, a low point, set alarms, uh, set, ti set time spans for certain things to happen. So it's a pretty sophisticated system. And, and, and I, guess, I guess if you have a situation where you set an alarm to watch for a, 
uh, problem condition, mm -hmm. and then that alarm goes off, right. then the guys here probably know mostly how to fix it, and if it's something beyond them, you've got escalation procedures and you just kick in everything into effect? That, that's exactly right. Um, depending, the, the primary concern for an alarm for these guys, I mean, I've obviously, number one, the building's on fire. Yeah. Uh, but let, let's forget about With it. With all this water? <laughs> yeah, I know. Tell me, concrete and water, and yeah. we have to have a sprinkler system. Um, but yeah, so if, we'll forget about that kind of emergency, but we'll get to life support. If we lose a pump on a system, if we lose chillers and that also do our HVAC, but they also cool down our cold water systems, th then we have a, a situation where time begins, the clock starts ticking. Yeah. Uh, if the water's not circulating, we're going to lose temperature or gain heat or whatever. We're going to stop oxygenating our water, which means the level of dissolved oxygen is going to go down. Uh, we're going to lose fish. We're going to start losing fish. So depending on the problem, depends on how they proceed. Sometimes it's simple and they reset a breaker. Uh, sometimes it's catastrophic and they're on the horn to me because I'm in charge of making sure the fish are okay. They're on the horn to maintenance. It just depends on the situation. But uh, if all things operate normally, even in the event of a power failure, we've got backup generators and our operations team who are really outstanding are, are capable of handling pretty much anything that happens. All right. Well, speaking of all these fish, let's go take a look at some of them. I got a bunch of them. Let's do it. Hey, by the way, do you eat sushi? Yes, I do. <laughs> Wow, is that the 88,000 gallon tank you were talking about? Yeah, it sure is. This is our River Giants exhibit, and this is a little different for us. We, we normally do an ecosystem and all the fish you would find there, but in this case, we're focusing on large fish from around the world and their plight. Uh, this exhibit uh, we did in conjunction with National Geographic and uh, Dr. Zeb Hogan. So our focus are these giant freshwater fishes that are disappearing. What size constitutes giant in fish terminology? Yeah, well, for, for Dr. Hogan's purposes, it's the six foot long or two meter length. If you exceed that, meat or exceed that, you're considered a mega fish. This is a giant gourami here where you can see all the scales. And that's about as big as they get, but they're really unique. And we have them, them in there as extra. But the catfish behind him is a Pangasius catfish. Wow. And you can actually, you know, you can buy those in the pet stores. And they, their record size on them is 9 feet 10 inches oh my and over 650 pounds. If so, you bought one in a store, would it eventually grow that big if you put it in a big enough tank? Uh, if, if you took proper care and gave it what it needed, yeah, it, wow. it, it, it probably wouldn't. That's the record. It'd probably get every bit of six or seven feet, though. I also see, like, stingrays in there. What's up with that? I thought those were saltwater fish. Yeah, well, you know, there are also freshwater stingrays. Um, the ones we have in here are really interesting animals. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a quick little story. Most of the fish you see in this exhibit, we've been growing uh, for about three years prior to the exhibit opening. Most of them came to us about three or four inches. Wow. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, some of them were confiscated animals, uh, other animals that were just available, and we knew this was coming and we got them. The stingrays are an interesting question, and I'm glad you asked about them because the three large stingrays we have, it cost us $54,000 to get them here as adults. Was that just the transportation, or that's what you had to pay for the fish, or what? That was the transportation. Wow. Yeah, so you imagine, those stingrays have to be in an ample volume of water, they have to be packed accordingly so that the water remains oxygenated, uh, they have to be loaded on a plane, so now you're talking about space and weight, and then they're flown. These guys came from Australia to LA, they had to go through customs, they had to be repacked, reoxygenated, clean water, and then shipped from LA to Atlanta where we picked them up and loaded them in a truck and drove them back to Chattanooga. I guess you need experts to accompany them the whole way as well, kind of. Yeah, you don't really have to accompany them, but what you have to do after the long flight from Australia to LA, where they had to clear customs, at that point they had to have a water change. They, they had to be dealt with, so we had to hire a company out there who had the wherewithal to deal with large containers for, you know, three and a half foot diameter stingrays. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, now you're talking about ca caring for them and doing things like water changes, but you know, we're over here where all the people are, and uh, that's some really thick glass. I don't see how you get access to that water to do anything to it. Well, let me tell you, it takes a lot to manage these systems. It also takes a lot to manage the animals, and it takes a, an entire support space to be able to do that. If you'd like, we can go up there and I can show you what we do. Of course we would like. Let's do it. Let's do it. That sounds good. <laughs> when we talked about getting closer to the fish, I didn't exactly have this in mind. We're standing on a platform like inches above the surface of the water. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. They're not man-eaters. Um, although, I want to say, 
Uh, it's surprising to me how big these fish are getting since we've grown them some, from such a small size. And guests who come and see them are going to be more and more surprised as time goes on. But let me tell you what we do. Yeah. This platform we're standing on is actually a dive platform. And on, uh, I think right now we're doing Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, three days a week. Uh, I have divers get in this tank at 11 a.m. and they clean for about 45 minutes. In the afternoon, they get back in the tank at 2 o'clock and they feed the fish by hand. Wow. Now, when you say clean, what do they clean? Like they're scrubbing algae and stuff? That's exactly right. Just like your fish tank yeah. at home yeah. where you have to clean the windows and scrape yeah. the algae and got to do the same thing here. We have a big giant vacuum system we use to gravel wash the gravel, just like you gravel vac at home. Okay. So yeah, we do all those things and they do the maintenance for us, three volunteers in the morning, two in the water, one surface tender, and then in the afternoon, two in the water and one surface tender. Uh, we do not allow them to hand feed the arapaima. That's the great big prehistoric looking one. Why not? Well, you ever play with your dog and he goes for the ball in your hand and yeah. accidentally gets your hand? If the arapaima misjudged and hit you or got you, it could be really bad. You lose a hand. Uh, you, you knock you out, knock you unconscious. I mean, they're very powerful. Oh. Probably not going to bite your hand off okay. or anything. But uh, we do have a catfish in here called the Wallago. They like to hang down here, and their teeth are very similar to like a green moray eel's teeth. They're conical, uh, and they point inward, backwards, like this. They're much smaller, but they have way more. So what happens is, if they get a hold of something... It it's not like coming a, out. Like a pit bull. Exactly. So we don't let them hand feed those guys. Just, again, the dog example. If they get your finger, it would be ugly. They use tongs for that. Yeah. And then the large alligator guard. There, there's a couple over here in the corner. There's a nice, big, beautiful oh. white one. Um, alligator those, guard. That sounds like a mean fish. Yeah, well, you know, they're really quite peaceful, but they've got an alligator-shaped head and rostrum there. And, and the reason we don't let them hand feed those guys is because when they eat, they slash sideways. Oh. And again, if they misjudge or you yeah. misjudge, your hand's in their mouth, and they got a pretty good bite, pretty good set of teeth. So they're, they're actually tong-fed from the surface. But everything else, the stingrays, the pangasius cats, the blue cats, everything that wants to eat from the divers can. They just hold food in their hand, and they just eat like a pigeon would right out of their hand. Pretty much. Pretty much. The stingrays are the worst. They're, they're like being in a litter of 100 puppies, and they're just all over you. <laughs> Quick break to talk about Netflix. If you're not a subscriber yet, you need to go to netflix.com forward slash geekbeat right now and get your free month and give it a try. And if you're already a subscriber, here's a few good shows to check out that I've been watching lately. First of all, one that I never thought I would have enjoyed is a sitcom called New Girl. Frankly, this show is kind of like Friends, which I can't stand, but it's starring that girl from the movie Elf and she was also in Yes Man. She played the girlfriend. What's her name, Norm? Zoe Deschanel. Zoe, yeah, she's she's awesome. Have you that girl has got a set of pipes on her? Have you heard her sing? She's amazing. Anyway, normally I wouldn't like this kind of show, but it's really funny. The characters are really interesting, and the episodes are only like 22 minutes long, so it's good for short attention spans. What was I saying? Next up, Outcasts is a show about a post-apocalyptic future where humans have fled Earth in search of a new home on the planet Carpathia. It's a great British series, which unfortunately is kind of rare, but even more unfortunately, it only lasts one season and then kind of leaves you hanging. I checked IMDB and there are no additional seasons that I can see coming, so that kind of sucks, but it's still an awesome show. So. Now I've moved on to exactly the opposite type of thing. Copper is a show set in the mid-1800s about a war hero turned police investigator in New York. This show is definitely not for the kids, but so far it's awesome. Great story, acting, cinematography, everything. Check it out if you like gritty western crime dramas. Is that even a category? I don't know. And remember, if you don't have Netflix yet, you need to get it. And you can try it for 30 days for free by going to netflix.com forward slash geekbeat. Now, off to the penguins. Lori Beth is bringing me into the penguin cage. No, it's not a cage. What is it? It's a penguin environment. What do we call it? This 
is an environment. This is a completely uh, enclosed and quarantined environment. We call this our Penguins Rock exhibit. Um, it's very much controlled. Everything that comes in here is disinfected and cleaned. Uh, the temperature is kept nice and chilly. It's around 45 degrees air temperature and our water stays about 40 degrees. So it's a completely different environment from what's on the other side of the door. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little nervous because uh, I hear penguins can be pretty tough and kind of territorial and stuff. You know, they are. They have this reputation of being very cute, very cuddly, but I can tell you that any of these birds that I tried to pick up are going to bite and they're going to fight. Really? They do not like to be held. Um, they don't really have teeth, but they have a beak that has a hook on the end of it. And uh, that... <laughs> That beat can, can pack quite a punch. They can leave some nice bruises on you if they're upset with you. I believe it. So is it true that penguins really mate for life? You know, they actually mate for a breeding season. Oh. Um, Gentoos do form very strong bonds, and we'll see several of our birds go back to the same mate year after year. But if they get moved around to another facility or if they got separated in the wild, they would find another pair. Now with the macaronis, it's a completely different story. The toughest female gets the toughest male, and that can change every year. Um, we even have a, a pair that, that paired up this year, and the male did not like her at all. But she was so tough and so forceful that she kind of forced herself on him. So he got stuck with her. Nice. Uh, so what kind of, uh, it looks like you guys have little grates and rocks. I mean, are they nesting? And what's up with the two that are kind of, uh, in their own little world over there. Okay, well we are in the middle of breeding season. Uh, the reason we use these grates is it makes it a little bit easier to clean. They build their nest out of rocks. Uh, we have probably around a thousand pounds of rocks in here right now. They carry those around one by one and build their nest. Um, and then as you can imagine, it gets very dirty, very gross in those penguin nests. So this allows us to clean it a little easier. Uh, now the reason we have acrylic over here and we have a family behind there is because we have a very young chick. We have oh. a chick um, in there and we need to make sure that that chick doesn't fall in the water. Right now it's not waterproof. Um, it's going to take until it's about two months old before it can go in the water. So that's to keep the chick in there. It's also to keep these nosy birds out. Uh, we don't really know if they would be aggressive or if they would be nice. But we don't want to take chances. We're not taking any chances. So are mama, that's mama and papa in there, are they going to stay in that little thing for two months? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, you know, we pay attention to their behavior, and as they're ready to get out and go for a swim, we'll lift them over, we'll let them out. Um, you know, these are two very calm birds, and they would be content to be in there all day long. They really wouldn't feel the need to leave. Uh, but we will watch them. Now, just because there's a, a chick in there does not necessarily mean that chick is going to make it. You know, every day is a struggle for, for these birds. Um, even here, in, even in your environment? Even here, um, because these are first-time parents. They've never parented together before, so they have to learn what they're supposed to do. Uh, they don't necessarily have the strongest instincts right now, so they're learning from that. And as keepers, we'll step in and we'll help them. Um, but we really don't, you know, we keep, don't want to jinx anything. We got to get that chick bigger and stronger. So. What does it take to be a penguin parent? I mean, you sit on the egg and let it hatch and feed the, what do you do? You know, it takes a lot of guts, actually, because you have birds constantly coming into your area, trying to steal your rocks, trying to take over your nest spot. Um, you weigh 10 pounds and you're trying to keep that egg from getting broken while you're sitting on top of it and a pile of rocks. Um, and you have to sit on that egg for 40 days. So that's a, a long time. And for macaronis, they get one shot. They get one egg a year. So if it breaks, it breaks. Um, and then there's always the potential that they've been sitting on that egg for 40 days and it's not even fertile. So then once that chick hatches, it sounds like a little squeaky toy, a little dog squeaky toy. And suddenly all these other birds start hearing that and they go, what is that? What is that? And so they kind of become a nuisance, just kind of peeking in. We have um, 26 birds, that's not counting our, our little one yet, um, and we have had seven of those born here since we opened our exhibit. Now we've gotten very lucky, all seven of those have been raised by their parents. So oh. we've, we've done very, very well. We want our birds to raise their own chicks because it's the only way they're going to get better, is by practice. Um, so we started out with 19, we're at 26 now. Um, our exhibit will fill up at 30, so in the future we'll have to move some of these birds on to other facilities, give them a chance to pair up and breed, um, and give our older adults a chance to continue to get better as parents. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sh letting us take a look and get up close and personal with the penguins. All right, All right you guys. 
we're going to go and take a look at some of the other stuff in the aquarium because on top of penguins and fish, there's reptiles and all kinds of other stuff. So let's do it. Okay, so we've seen fish, we've seen infrastructure, we've seen birds, we've seen penguins, but that's not all. There's a lot more to the aquarium. Starting with the jellyfish, take a look at these things. I would never want to get this close to them in the wild, but those are some massive, massive jellyfish. They've got big ones. Check out over here. They've also got little tiny ones. This tank is full of them, but look at the, these little white flecks floating in the water. Those aren't little flecks. Those are actually tiny little jellyfish swimming around. Big ones, small ones, medium-sized ones venomous ones, harmless ones, they got it all. Speaking of things that can do harm to you, you gotta check out the shark tank, come on. I know that we said that they have the largest freshwater aquarium anywhere, but they also have salt water, including this massive 618,000 gallon tank we're standing right beneath, which of course includes the sharks. That's right, there's over five million pounds of water right above us. Let's go check out some of these sharks. I hope you enjoyed our visit to the Tennessee Aquarium. I thought it was awesome. I can't believe how much equipment they had, how much computerized stuff they did, all the amazing animals they have here. So if you get a chance, come visit Chattanooga, come to the Tennessee Aquarium. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up on YouTube, geekbeat.tv, you know, youtube.com forward slash geekbeat.tv. All right, guys, I'm John P. I'll see you later. Hey folks, it's John P. I'm just doing an intro right now. Rah, rah, rah. Hey.